Greetings, Des King at kskdesign.com.au and welcome to the second video in my Shoji and Kumiko pattern series. In this video, I'll run through a series of exercises designed to practice the sawing skills that I believe are critical for cutting Kumiko and making the Shoji we'll tackle in the third video. All these exercises are detailed in Book 1, The Basics. With Kumiko, sawing is the key but here in the West, we don't have access to the expensive, highly precise, purpose-built computer-controlled machinery available in Japan. So we have to rely heavily on hand tools and hand skills to make shoji and kumiko patterns. This is no different from what Japanese shoji makers, or tateguya, and kumiko shokunin, those who focus primarily on kumiko artwork, had to do in past centuries. And their work was extremely tight, perfectly crafted and has stood the test of time. Making shoji and kumiko patterns by hand is certainly much more time consuming, but with the right skills and practice, it's well within anyone's reach to be able to make the kind of shoji you can fit with pride anywhere in your home. To keep this video manageable, I'll break it up into two parts. For the first part, the first couple of exercises will simply be using a handsaw to cut on and to a line then using a handsaw and chisel to cut out kumiko half-lap joints. For these first couple of exercises, you'll need a piece of timber, preferably softwood, around about 50 to 60 millimetres wide, about 30 millimetres thick, and a manageable length, say around about 400 to 500 millimetres long. You'll need a fine tooth cross-cut handsaw. The saw I use for all my kumiko cutting is a Nakaya Dozuki. It's designed specifically for kumiko, and has very fine teeth with an extremely thin curve. You'll need a marking knife, a marking gauge, an accurate square, a pencil, and a piece of kumiko, around about a quarter of an inch thick, 6.4 millimetres thick, and between 15 and 16 millimetres wide. Throughout this series, I'll tend to use English terms for parts, joints, and processes where a suitable English term exists. Where it doesn't exist, I'll use the Japanese term. Naturally, I'll explain any Japanese term fully before using it. There are two Japanese terms that I'd like you to remember right from the start, though. These two terms have English equivalents, but they can be confusing and are not always particularly clear. The first is mikomi, and the second is mitsuke. When the kumiko is fitted, mikomi is the part of the kumiko that you see when looking from the side. Mitsuke is the part of the kumiko that you see looking from the front. This diagram shows this clearly. These are very convenient terms that prevent any confusion that may arise when using terms such as width, depth, thickness or any other similar term. The first exercise is simply cutting on and to a line. When sawing, you should have a relaxed stance with your front between, say, 30 and 45 degrees to the line of cut, and make sure you don't tense your arms and shoulder muscles. The saw handle should sit comfortably in your hand with your forefinger running either along the top or to the side of the handle, whichever is more comfortable. And make sure you don't grip the handle too tight. Don't strangle it. Hold it with about the same pressure you'd hold an egg. Firm, but not so tight that the egg's going to break. First, set your marking gauge at just over half of the mikomi of your practice kumiko. So if the kumiko was 15 millimetres, set the marking gauge at around about 8 millimetres. Next, mark a line along both sides of the practice piece. That mark is your depth of cut. If you like, you can run a pencil line along that mark so it's easier to see. Next, make five marks across the face with the square and the marking knife. These marks should be around about five millimetres apart. When sawing, 
from the front the saw blade handle your hand forearm and elbow should form generally a straight line set the heel of the saw on the line with your forefinger or thumb as a guide then pull the blade back along the line to establish the curve and then continue cutting down to the line so set the heel in the line using your forefinger or thumb as a guide pull it back to establish the curve and continue cutting don't force the cut and the return push stroke should only be very light once you've cut those five mark another five lines and cut those again down to the line. Remember, use the entire blade in smooth, even strokes. The return push stroke after the cut should only be very, very light. Remember, place the heel on the line using your forefinger as a guide, pull it back to establish the curve, and then continue cutting. <laughs> So continue that exercise until you're satisfied that your cuts are straight, perpendicular to the face and down to the line in the majority of cases. The next exercise we'll do is cutting out half lap joints for the kumiko. You'll need the same tools we used in the first exercise plus a 6mm chisel. There is a special marking tool for these joints called a nicho shiragaki. It has two knives and it marks both sides of the joint according to how wide you set those two knives. Personally, I've never had much success using this and I prefer marking the way that I'll show you in this exercise. First, mark a line along both sides of the practice piece with the marking gauge, again just over half of the mikomi of the kumiko. Place five marks across the face, about 25 millimetres apart. These are for the half lap joints, and these lines are the left hand side of the joint. The kumiko will sit on the right hand side of that line, like this. So place a pencil mark on the side that the kumiko sits. When cutting, as we did in the first exercise, place the heel of the saw in the line, pull it back gently to establish the curve, <laughs> and cut down to the line. Once you've made the five cuts, flip the piece around, and now comes the critical part of cutting kumiko joints. Place the kumiko against the square and gradually move them both over until the right hand side of the kumiko just covers the line you just cut. Once the kerf is no longer visible, remove the kumiko 
and mark. As I mentioned, this is a critical part. If you move the kumiko over too far, the joint is going to be far too tight and more than likely the kumiko will snap. Not a happy day. If you don't move it over far enough, you're going to have an ugly gap in the half lap joint. At this stage, we'll just mark the one joint. Cut along this line to the depth line Once you've made your cut, remove the waste with your 6mm chisel. Now comes the moment of truth. Try to fit the Kumiko and see whether it's too tight, too loose, or just right. And that is a good fit. The Kumiko should fit firmly, but not so tight that you have to force it in. It should just slide in and remain there. From this joint, you should now be better able to judge the point where you should stop moving the square and the Kumiko across to mark the right hand side of the joint. You've cut the first joint, now cut the four remaining half lap joints and continue this exercise until you're satisfied that you can judge this accurately and are able to cut Kumiko that fit their joints cleanly and firmly. That's all for the first part of these exercises. In part two we'll practice cutting the Jaguchi joint and you'll find out what that is when we come to it and also a few mortise and tenon exercises in preparation for making the shoji frames. Thanks for watching and I hope you'll join me for part two. See you then.